I'm just gonna take this in for a minute because I'm back in New York and it feels really good to be on this stage. I left New York 25 years ago. I left on a whim. I was totally following my heart. I definitely wasn't following my head. And I've spent half my life now in Italy raising a family, creating a restaurant, chasing after a dream. So it all began here, on these streets, in this town, in 1993, when I met my husband, Massimo Bottura. And it's a classic story of serendipity. Two people walk into a cafe. They don't really know what they're looking for. They're both at a crossroads, and that meeting gives purpose and definition to the rest of their lives. So thank you to the Welcome Conference for having me here, letting me share some of these stories. You really can't imagine how amazing it is for me to be here. So a couple pictures from our little journey, Cafe di Nona. We were working at a place on the corner of Grand and Mercer. It was not a fancy restaurant at all. We met, we shared some good times. I saw someone who I thought had incredible talent. I was behind a bar making cappuccinos, and I saw this shining star. And when Massimo, our time there was very short and limited, I, I like to think that it was an oasis because it no longer exists, that cafe. And when Massimo went back to Italy, New York was no longer the same for me. And so I followed him. I followed him back to Modena, and two years later, he was opening a restaurant called Osteria Francescana. I, at the time, was back in New York because my father wasn't well, and I received a phone call from Massimo the day he was opening the restaurant, and he said, Laura, we're going to get married, right? Very, very typical Massimo. He's not going to ever give you a direct question. And I didn't really understand what was happening at the time. I don't even know if I said yes or no. But in hindsight, I realized that he was asking me to marry a restaurant. <laughs> and I did. I married a restaurant with my heart and soul. I married it metaphorically, emotionally, physically, and that's where the real love story begins. It's a love story of a restaurant, a small osteria with big dreams, chasing after stars, whatever they would be, Michelin stars, chasing after them. I don't know where those Michelin stars, how they got in my husband's head, but they really have been tormenting us for a long time. So, we skip ahead. Back in New York, 2016, we're no longer in that cafe in the corner of Grand and Mercer, but we're on a stage and receiving this award for the best restaurant in the world. And it still boggles my mind. I'm trying to figure out how we got there from A to Z an obscure little osteria in a lesser-known town in Italy, Modena, to one of the best restaurants in the world. So I just turned 50, and when you turn 50, what happens is you start kind of trying to compress the first, 50, first half of your life and figure out what happened so you can get on with the rest of it. And so that A to Z I've been analyzing, how do you map that path how do you know when things were really beginning or when they're ending? And what is it that changes inside of you during that process? So I'm trying to do that for you today. We all have different ideas about what it is to reach our goals. Some of the common words are hard work, struggle, humility, determination, focus, talent, luck. They're all in there, and they're all totally valid. But we also know that that path is never a linear one. And those Google Maps, as addicted as we are to them, they're not going to get you there. 
There's no choice between the fast route or the scenic route, and most of the time getting lost is part of the deal. What I've been recently thinking about is that getting from here to there is actually a lot more about the deviations and the disruptions that happen along the way. The disruptions that happen to you randomly and the deviations you choose to make. Those are the things that actually start giving definition to this whole big massive thing that you're doing day after day. And when you look back, it's kind of the things that you really remember. So I'll do a very quick run through of our last 25 years. 1995 we open, big dreams. Massimo had run a restaurant for nine years. He'd come to New York, he'd cooked with Elaine Ducasse. I really thought this guy knew what he was doing. <laughs> he was determined, he was assured that this was gonna be a great success. We opened a small restaurant, but right in the center of town. Five years goes along, and there are no Michelin stars, but not even close, like not even near it. Five years, and what, what does happen? We have two children. First Alexa, 1996, and then Charlie, 2000. And what I realized is that my, my career in the hospitality industry is over. And Massimo says to me in 2000, that's enough. We're not having any more kids. Because kids are not in that sort of trajectory of what it is to make a successful restaurant. <laughs> 2001 comes along. It's spring. There's still no Michelin stars. And we get the worst review we've ever had. This review was a double whammy, because not only were they talking about how bad and how confusing Massimo's kitchen was, they didn't understand anything. They were also talking about the art on the walls. So there we were. I was getting criticized for my choices to put art on the walls and Massimo for his kitchen. And he's such a drama queen. He was like, oh, we're going to close the restaurant. Forget about it. It's done. It's over. <laughs> now, we had invested everything in this restaurant. I mean, we, he sold his motorcycle, and we had no money. We were raising these two children. I said, no, no, no. We are not going to close the restaurant. Think about it in a positive way. They noticed us, OK? <laughs> Six months goes on. It's November. And that same restaurant guide comes up with this weird, like, new, innovative chef of the year, and it's Massimo Bottura. I'm saying, well, that's a lot of mixed messages. They changed their mind really quickly. But two weeks later, we got our Michelin star. Yay. Finally, there was our confirmation. We were doing something right. And like so many of us in this business, you get that first confirmation, and you're so excited that you go and spend all the money that you don't have fixing up your restaurant. You go to make it better. It's not enough that you got that first star, because the morning you wake up after, you're already dreaming about the next one. And so you invest in your cutlery, and your tablecloths, and your better kitchen equipment, and your team, and your people, and your ideas, and you work really hard and you kind of wait around for that next star to come. Well, it didn't come for quite a while, another five years down the line. And I have to be very thankful to my dad, who was really great, crossed the Atlantic, watching us, giving us some good advice. And the best advice that he gave us all along the line, he would say to Massimo, be like a tree, grow slowly. Now, if anybody knows my husband, the only part of that sentence that he understood was grow, because slowly has nothing to do with his DNA in any way whatsoever. But it's a good thing that one word sunk in. And in hindsight, I have to say that I'm very thankful for those 11 years that it took for us to get that second Michelin star, because during those 11 years, we had time to mature, to know who we are, to find our identity, to get our team going, to get our feet on the ground, plant our roots, and be ready for the storms to come. A couple years go on, and we get invited to this new 
up-and-coming restaurant list. It's called the World's 50 Best, and it's 2009 when we get a letter to go to London. We didn't really have any idea. No one was talking about this list. It wasn't a big deal. I had no idea that we were even on the, you know, who knows what number the year before. We go to London, and um, we were so casual about it. I think I was wearing a pair of, like, black Converse sneakers, and we show up at this big, beautiful hall, and women have their hats on and their dresses. And they do this ceremony in such an amazing way, it really feels like the Oscars. They start counting from 50 all the way up to the number one. And we were sure we were going to be like 49, 48, there you go. As we're sitting there, the numbers go. And they get to 14, and we still haven't been called. And I'm thinking, wow, this is something kind of amazing. And Massimo's phone is kind of bzz, 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 the whole time next to us. Do you know Massimo? You know he's always on the phone. And then we get announced, new entry at number 13. It was an incredible moment for us, an honor. And we were among so many of our colleagues that we respected. Unbeknownst to us, at that very same night, Back in Italy, when I was thinking our friends were calling us because they wanted to know what was happening, actually, we were the centerpiece of this scandal on Italian television, national TV, about molecular cuisine. And they had been filming inside Austria Francescana secretly while we're there in London. So the moral of the story is we don't come back to Italy as heroes in any way whatsoever. We come back, and our kids are teased at school, and we're at the center of this stovetop polemics about molecular cuisine. I mean, what is molecular cuisine anyway? Nonetheless, we ride out that storm. We ride out that storm, and we become stronger. And in the years to come, we eventually get what Massimo was keeping his focus on, which is third Michelin star. And I have to say, it's kind of like that scene in the movie where, you know, someone holds on to something so tightly, it gets them through the war, it gets them through being on a desert island. Those three, that, that dream of the three stars kept him focused and didn't let him sway. I used to joke around with him all the time, and I would say, Massimo, you know, they're not going to give you that third star until you're 50 years old. You've got to be like the gran maestro. You're going to have this big white beard. And you're going to be like the guy, the old guy, who's doing contemporary Italian cuisine. But I was wrong. They gave it to him when he was 49. <laughs> and it was a great moment for us. But we woke up the next day and really felt like it was a new beginning. So much of a new beginning that we started tearing down the restaurant again renovating everything, the kitchen. This time it wasn't because we wanted to reach another star. There are no more stars on that list. We wanted to give a celebration to our team to say thank you. We were going to build a better kitchen, a better restaurant, a more beautiful dining room, invest again in team and quality. And right in the middle of those renovations, something happened. A disruption so great, we, couldn't, we still can't even quite imagine it. An earthquake hit Emilia Romagna in May, two earthquakes actually, in May 2012. And we were right in the middle of our renovations. We were very lucky, our restaurant wasn't scathed. But the area of Emilia Romagna was terribly damaged economically. Some of you may have heard of Parmigiano wheels being destroyed and damaged, artisans, beautiful bell towers, the landscape was changed forever. But that earthquake was a blessing in disguise. Because for us, that earthquake taught us, it made us realize that we had been very, very selfish. We had been focusing on us. We had been focusing on our dream to get there, on what we needed to do to become, to have those three stars, to, be, to become a successful restaurant. And in the big scheme of things, that's so small and so petty. What we realized from that earthquake is that we had a voice and there was an opportunity to use it. And so we reached out to our community, we reached out to the dairy farmers, we did what we could, we used our voice, and we started to connect to our country and our town and the people who were providing amazing ingredients and 
really enabling us to do what we do in a completely different way. This event also led up to, I think, what is the greatest deviation that we have ever made, and the scariest one of all. So, for those of you who don't know, we started a nonprofit called Food for Soul. Food for Soul opens up community kitchens that we call refitorios. These refitorios work with food waste, food coming from ingredients that have been off the, the supermarket shelves, recycled, reclaimed, and we transform them into delicious meals in welcoming settings. Beautiful, welcoming. And this is what we're doing with this project. Our refectorios are very small. The first one we opened in 2015 in Milan, a year after in Rio, another in London, and another in Paris. And I have to say I'm quite embarrassed to say that when Massimo had this idea, back in 2013, I was totally terrified against it. I was frightened. Here we were, a reputable restaurant, we had a good ranking, we were finally stable, things were going fine. Why did we need to do this? So it was a Sunday morning, and Massimo said to me, I've got a great idea. When Massimo says, I've got an idea of any kind whatsoever, I try to find a chair and I sit down, because I don't know what is hitting me. <laughs> and to give some context to this, it was the beginning of people talking about Expo. Expo was in Milan in 2015. Milan is two hours away from Modena. But we were already getting questions. You know, do you want to come and open up a pop-up restaurant? Do you want to be part of Expo in the, in the fair and do a dinner and do a talk and blah, blah, blah? And all these things were coming out of us. None of it seemed like it was addressing the theme of Expo, which was feed the planet. And so Massimo that morning said to me, what if we did something different? We opened a community kitchen outside of the fairgrounds and started cooking with the waste from Expo, the inevitable waste that will happen in that fair. And what if I call on my friends, my colleagues from around the world who can come and help me transform food waste into delicious and healthy meals for those in need? We can call on our friends, our artists, architects, designers. They can help us transform any space that we find into something beautiful and welcoming. And like I said, I thought this was a terrible idea. I think my reaction was, I was totally silent, I closed my eyes, and in my head was whizzing, I thought this could be a public relations nightmare. There are so many possible things that could go wrong, and so many working parts to put together. And in fact, Milan was a complete experiment in instability. We had no idea what we were doing, we had never cooked in a soup kitchen, and we had never worked with food waste. All we could do was learn quickly and apply what we knew from Austria Francescana. And in looking for, solu for solutions to fight food waste, we actually stumbled upon a simple formula with incredible potential to make a wider impact for change we became even more aware of something we already knew from our 20 plus years of Austria Francescana, that a good meal in a welcoming environment is more than the sum of its parts. It can change a community. And I have to say, there's a dish up here by Daniel Hum. He was the first chef who came to cook May 28, 2015, and he made a strawberry gazpacho. He had no idea what it was in for. Hours before he arrived, we were cleaning off the kitchen's counters that had never been used. And Daniel Hum came last week to Paris with Josh and Michael from his staff, and they cooked a meal once again. They said they actually felt like they were a little bit back in the old days where they had to kind of rush around and three hours to get a meal for 100 people on the table. And I have to say that all of our friends in the restaurant industry, front of house, kitchen staff, Everyone who's come along and said, yes, I'm going to help you. Yes, I'm going to cook for one night. 
They've added so much value to this service, so thank you to all of them. So what does a fine dining restaurant have to do with opening soup kitchens? I still can't quite figure that out. I'm in the middle of it. We're trying to move forward. But there's one word that comes to mind that really pulls them to do them together. And up here we have some dishes from Osteria Francescana, and we have a scene from the Refettorio in Rio, doing completely different things, and yet the aesthetic is a mirror image one of the other. So what connects the two is this Latin verb called rificere. My daughter studied Latin, thank goodness, I didn't. And rificere is really the root word of the refettorio. And a refettorio is a place where nuns and monks would gather at the end of the day to pray and have a meal together. Nourish their souls, nourish their bodies. And that's where we got the idea for the refettorios. And it's what we do. At our refettorio kitchens, we're trying to bring dignity to the table. Reficere means to remake, to repair, but also to restore. It's also the root word of ristorante, restaurant. And that is what we're doing at Osteria Francescana, trying to create a holistic experience that is not just about eating a meal. So in this parallel mirror image, we created this first soup kitchen instinctively, applying what we knew. But when we went on to create the second and the third, we had to kind of take a step back and, and look, what were, those, what were the values that we were trying to express? And we learned more about ourselves than we could have even imagined. So we sort of came up with these three pillars, something that we had established over years at Osteria Francescana. And the three pillars apply to both quality of the ideas, the power of beauty, and the value of hospitality. On the top we have Austria Francescana, and on the bottom we have some images of some of our refettorios around the world. Quality of ideas. Cooking is not just about the quality of ingredients. It really is about the quality of the ideas. And in a country like Italy, where you have beautiful artisanal products and history and traditions. You can get lost in the idea that creating a recipe is an intellectual act. It's not like riding a bicycle. You need to concentrate, you need to be humble, you need to use your technique, your mind. How you're going to put something together into an edible bite that is going to express who you are and how you see the world. And that's what we do at Austria Francescana. But quality of ideas is also what we're doing at the refettorios. We're asking chefs, local chefs, chefs from around the world to come and share the quality of their ideas. What are they sharing? Trucks arrive every day with surplus from supermarkets, and most of the ingredients that are there are not looking so great. We're asking the chefs to take something that's not very beautiful, that's wilted, that's about to expire, whether it's a dairy or a meat or a vegetable, some stale bread, and turn it into something beautiful, healthy, and delicious. That's the quality of the ideas. And that's the hope that we have for working with surplus food, reclaimed food, and food waste. Power of beauty. Power of beauty, I came from the art world. So when I moved to Italy, I thought I was going to lose all of that. And in the end, I ended up contaminating everyone and everything, even the kitchen. So for us at Austria Francescana, art is the landscape of our ideas. And the artwork on the walls is not just about being decorative. It's about decoding our language. It's little clues to get you to understand what's happening in the kitchen. But art is also a universal language, reaches everybody. And it's powerful. And it can communicate ideas that we never could. So at the refettorios, we believe that art is very, very important. Beauty is important. It's one of those indivisible goods. It doesn't need to be divided up, and it really can't. The more beauty there is, the more there is for everyone. And that means the people who are dining with us, the chefs who are working there, the volunteers that make this possible, and the community around us. Value of hospitality. So hospitality to us 
is about unlocking the power of food. It's about the storytelling, the sharing, what happens, the exchange at the table, greeting someone when they come to the restaurant, and making them feel that they are the most important moment. Hospitality is so much about the restaurant business, you know, when, when you think about restore. When first restaurants came along, they weren't really about fine dining. They were about uh, someone who's driving a caravan, coming in from a long day, dusty jacket, somehow being able to sit at a table and be treated in a way that brought dig dignity to their day and their job, and they felt a little bit cleaner and a little bit brighter, a little bit healthier and happier when they got up from that table and left. So the value of hospitality at our community, community kitchens is really about the volunteers. We ask volunteers to serve at our tables. We are not doing self-service. Every guest is invited to sit at a table of their choice, and they are served a three-course meal. When we can, we address them by name. It's an opportunity to tell people what's, what we're serving that night. It's an opportunity to ask people how was their day, or did they like the soup, or did they like the vegetable dish, the dessert? Would they like a second course? I read a beautiful quote by a French philosopher, Simone Weil, and she said, Attention is the rarest and purest kind of generosity. And I think that's what we hit on here with the Refertorio Project. A little bit of attention in a direct and focused way can go a very, very long way. So something, something's happening here. There's this boomerang effect happening to us. We created these community kitchens and they're coming back at us and changing the way we see our own restaurants and also what we think about what restoration means to us at Osteria Francescana. Perhaps they're shaping and changing our own future identity. This is an artwork. It's what I love to talk about most, art. This is an artwork by an Italian conceptualist named Alghero Boetti. We love Boetti because he was so crazy. He was into duality, creating a mirror image of everything. At some point in his career, back in the 70s, he divided himself. He became Alghero and Boetti. How cool is that? He was into the negative and the positive. He was into breaking the rules. And one of the greatest gifts that he gave was this idea of tutto. Tutto means everything in Italy, in Italian. And tutto is something that keeps going around in our brain. We have a tasting menu now at Austria Francescana, and it's called tutto. And we're putting everything in there. There's our past and our present and our future. There's the traditional and the unconventional. There's hot, there's cold, there's luxury, there's simplicity. It's an all-encompassing idea. This menu is not about singularity. But what we've realized that Austria Francescana is not about singularity. It's about duality. And with that duality, we have mirror images of ourselves and we can express all the possibilities. This work is made with paper and a ballpoint pen. And the title is Mettere Verbi all'infinito. So I'll try to translate the Italian for you. There's a pun in there, so there's a double meaning. The literal meaning is take verbs and put them in their most basic tense, the infinitive tense to run, to jump, to laugh. The second meaning is let the verbs take you to infinity. Let them take you to that above and beyond, to the limitless, to the never-ending, to the everything, 
I think Boetti was imagining verbs flying out into the cosmos. But why not? So if we look closer at this work, it was made in 1978. All the letters of the alphabet are on the margin, so you can combine them in any way you want to and come up with numerous combinations of verbs. The lines are made with a ballpoint pen, and they're made one after the other. This guy was already thinking about equality in the workplace. He had two people make this artwork. One was a woman and one was a man. First the woman put the line down, a little more precise, and the man put the line down, then the woman did a line, and a man did a line, and a woman did a line, and a man did a line, and so on and so forth, and so on and so forth. Those lines to me are what we do every day. Those lines to me mean you show up, you do your dues, you tie your shoes, you come in and you realize there's a button on your jacket that's loose and you're going to sew it. You got your mise en place organized. You're going to debone that chicken the best you can. You're going to say hello to everyone and you're going to say goodbye to everyone at the end of the night. Day after day after day, you can see it as drudgery or you can see it as something joyful, but you are there. And the only way to realize small dreams or big dreams is to put down those lines one after the other. And then in this piece, there are the commas. They're really important, the commas. The commas are the disruptions, those crazy disruptions that happen to us that we have no control over. But the commas are also the deviations we decide to make when we make those left turns when we're not supposed to, U-turns, we decide to change our path. So, A to Z. This isn't really a map of A to Z, is it? It's a metaphor. It's a story that still has to be written. It's your story. It's the endless possibilities of becoming. There is no ultimate grand finale, and we learned that when we became the world's number one restaurant, because once again we realized it was just a beginning. So getting from A to Z is really about putting down those verbs, and I have some for you. To make, to share, to cook, to serve, to feed, and to care. To remake, to repair, and to restore. Let's embrace all of the disruptions. Let's deviate. Let's multiply ourselves, find our mirror image. Let that boomerang hit us on the head because that really is the master plan. Thank you.